Hello, welcome to module 17 of the course on application of spectroscopic methods in molecular structure determination. In this module, we will continue with mass spectrometry and look into some aspects of electron impact ionization mass spectrometry and chemical ionization mass spectrometry. These are the two most widely used mass spectrometric techniques for structure elucidation of simple organic molecules with the molecular weight range of something like 800 to 1000 or so. <coughs> In the electron impact ionization mass spectrometry, high energy electron beams where the electronic energy is about 70 electron volt is used. Most organic compounds has an ionization potential in the range of 10 to 15 electron volt. So, the use of the high energy electron beam essentially ensures that all the molecules which come in contact with such a beam is essentially ionized using these two mechanisms that are shown here. The molecule can either knock off an electron from its valence shell by the high energy electron to produce the cation radical or the electron can be added to the molecule producing the anion radical. So, mass spectrometry can be done either in the positive ion mode detecting the cation radical species that are produced or in the negative ion mode detecting the anion species that are produced during the course of the ionization. This is a simple diagrammatic representation of a mass spectrometer consisting of a sample chamber in which sample is produced in the vapor phase and then an ionization chamber and then an acceleration zone and finally a detector sorry finally a magnetic sector analyzer and a detector which is connected to the computer. Now in the sample chamber essentially the sample is introduced and it is brought to the gas phase by applying a vacuum of 10 to the power minus 2 tar or so. Most organic compounds are volatile in nature, therefore it is possible to bring them in the gaseous state. Those molecules which are not volatile is normally heated in the sample chamber and brought sufficient vapor pressure is brought into the gas phase so that it can be pumped into the ionization chamber. The ionization chamber is maintained at a much higher vacuum of 10 to the power minus 7 tar or 10 to the power minus 6 tar in that particular range and this essentially consists of a cathode ray tube kind of an arrangement where you have an electrode. Uh, there are two electrodes. One of them is a heated filament which produces the electrons of high energy which gets attracted to the negative electrode of the combination of electrodes that you have here. The sample essentially passes through a slit through this electrode here and this sample is brought into under the stream of electron which are having high energy and this is the process by which the ionization take place and this, this equations represent chemistry that is taking place in this region of the ionization chamber of the mass spectrometer. Now there are two electrodes placed here, this is a called a repeller electrode. This essentially repels depending upon the voltage bias of this electrode, if it is a positively biased voltage of the electrode then the positive ions will get rippled. If it is a negatively biased electrode, then the negative ions will get rippled, essentially getting attracted to the opposite electrode on the other side of the ionization chamber. So, in the process, the ions get accelerated towards the electrode of uh, opposite uh, bias polarity and they get essentially uh, into the acceleration zone. The acceleration is done by applying certain voltage so that the ions get attracted to that particular electrode. Through a small orifice in the electrode, the ions that are produced come into the analyzer which is the magnetic sector analyzer. The magnetic sector analyzer essentially is a bent tube and in this uh, magnetic sector analyzer, the ions take a curvature in terms of the trajectory of the ion, it is a curvature and those ions which have the curvature matched with the curvature of this tube, analyzer tube essentially reach the detector. Those heavy ions which have a larger curvature for example, uh, they get heat on the walls in this particular side and the lighter ions which have the lower curvature, they get hit on the wall in the other side of the tube. So, only uh, ions which have the m by z ratio which has the which matches with the curvature of the ionization tube sorry the analyzer tube is essentially reaches the detector and it gets detected in the detector and fed into the computer to record a mass spectrum. Now we will look into the mechanism of the segregation or the analysis of the ions separation of the ions based on their m by z value in the next slide. Now after the production of the ions they are accelerated by application of a potential volt V. In other words the 
ions are produced here and there is a potential of uh, volt V is applied between these two electrodes so that the ions that are produced get accelerated towards that particular electrode. So, the potential energy of the ions that are produced under the voltage of V, acceleration voltage of V essentially corresponds to the charge times the potential which is Zv. Now, it is converted into the kinetic energy of the ion during the course of the acceleration. The potential energy that are produced in the ions that are produced here with certain potential energy gets transferred into the kinetic energy. So, the Zv actually becomes half mv square during the process of acceleration. Half mv square is the kinetic energy, m is the mass of the ion and v is the velocity of the ion under the voltage of V which is the acceleration voltage. Capital V and small v are distinguished in this case. Capital V corresponds to the applied potential which is the acceleration potential. Small v is the velocity of the ions that is produced. In the magnetic field of analyzer, they are drawn into a circular motion by the field. This is what I refer to having a curvature in terms of the motion of the ions in a magnetic sector. It takes a curvature. The curvature radius depends on the mass of the ion, ma mass to charge ratio of the ion. At equilibrium, the centrifugal force and the centripetal forces are equal acting on this particular ion. In other words, when it is passing through this particular uh, circular pathway, the centripetal force and the centrifugal force have to be equal in order for the ion to survive and go through the radius of curvature of this analyzer and that is what is represented here. The centrifugal force is mv square by r where r is the radius of curvature of that particular ion of mass m and the centripetal force is essentially Zbv. The centripetal force is essentially the charge times the magnetic field strength times the velocity of the ion produced under this condition. So, when the centripetal and the centrifugal forces match each other, they are equal and this is represented in equation 2. If you combine equation 1 and equation 2, essentially you get this equation where the mass to charge ratio of the ion of mass m and charge z corresponds to the square of the magnetic field strength, square of the radius of curvature of the tube, analyzer tube and 2 times the voltage divided by 2 times the voltage of the acceleration voltage. So, essentially in a mass spectrometer, there is no one weighing the masses using a balance. In fact, the masses are segregated by the application of suitable magnetic field and the acceleration voltage. By tuning the acceleration voltage and the magnetic field strength, one can bring a specific ion into the curvature R which matches the spectrometer curvature. Only those ions which match the spectrometer curvature will go through this passage and reach the detector. The rest of the ions which do not have the radius of curvature corresponding to the radius of the spectrometer essentially will get destroyed by hitting the walls of the, the walls of the analyzer tube in a spectrometer. So, only a fraction of the ions will essentially pass through the particular uh, radius of curvature which is tuned by the magnetic field strength and the acceleration voltage. Now, during the bombardment of the molecules with the 70 electron volt electron beam, there is a large excess of kinetic energy that is imparted on the molecule. The EI process leads to extensive fragmentation of the ion as a result of the excess kinetic energy that is given to the molecule. In other words, more than the ionization potential energy is applied. As a result of that, the excess energy gets the molecule into higher vibrational state. From the higher vibrational state, of course, they undergo extensive fragmentation by breaking of bonds. The fragmentation of an organic molecule is not a bad thing actually. It is a reproducible under standard ionization condition. So, it is acting like a fingerprint of that particular molecule so, as long as the standard ionization conditions are maintained in a spectrometer. If there are two spectrometers which are both uh, electron impact ionization mode, as long as they are operated under standard conditions of 70 electron volts, the spectra that is produced and the fragmentation that is produced by the molecule will essentially look the same. So, as a result of that one can have a library of fragmentation pattern of various types of compounds because the fragmentation process is essentially a reproducible process under standard set of conditions. Now, some fragments, some compounds fragment so easily that their lifetime is so short the molecular ion is never detected in the mass spectrum. In other words, it is not always necessary that mass spectrum will give you the information regarding the molecular weight of the compound. Sometime it is not possible to have the molecular weight of the compound detected because the corresponding ion is sh too short lived to be detected in a mass spectrometer. 
The high molecular weight compounds such as proteins and biopolymers are relatively non-volatile. In addition to that, it is difficult to keep the molecular ion frag from fragmentation. So the fragmentation process make it difficult for the analysis of high molecular weight uh, compounds by electron impact ionization. This is where the electro spray ionization mass spectrometry and the MALDI mass spectrometry come in handy because under those conditions which are considered to be softer ionization technique, the ions that are produced do not undergo extensive fragmentation. Now let us come to the chemical ionization process. This is relatively speaking a softer ionization technique. In case the electron impact ionization mass spectra does not give the molecular ion peak, one can rely on the chemical ionization mass spectrometry to detect the molecular ion peak. How does it work? It is fairly simple. Instead of directly bombarding the molecules with a high energy electron, a stream of ionized gas is used. In other words, you have a reagent gas which gets ionized by bombardment of this high energy electrons first and the ionized gas molecules in turn react with the substrate and by a simple collisional process between the sample molecule and the ionized gas, ionization takes place by various mechanism. The commonly used reagents for the ionization, in other words the reagent gas which gets ionized commonly are the methane, ammonia and ice. When methane is used as a reagent gas, the following chemical reaction take place in the ionization chamber. Essentially, the concentration of methane is much higher than the substrate. So, the electron beam interacts with the methane producing the methane cation radical initially by the ionization of methane molecule interacting with 70 electron volt electron beams. The methane cation radical that is produced loses a hydrogen atom to pro produce a methyl cation or it reacts with another molecule of methane in a bimolecular gas phase reaction to produce the methonium ion which is an oxonium kind of an ion. This is a hypervalent uh, carbon with a positive charge so it is CH5 plus is what is produced. It is a very strong acid because it can donate a proton very readily to the substrate and that is a reaction that takes place essentially with the substrate. The substrate gets protonated and in the process it gets ionized. It is not by the removal of an electron from the substrate it gets ionized. It is by addition of a proton it gets the positive charge. The usually the protonated molecular ion is what is seen as the intense peak in the methane reagent gas mass uh, chemical ionization mass spectrometry. CH5 plus as I mentioned is a very strong acid and it is capable of protonating the Lewis basic sites of the substrate and thereby producing the protonated substrate molecule. When ammonia is used as a reagent gas, the following reaction take place in the mass spectrometer. Ammonia gets ionized to the ammonium ca ammonia cation radical. The ammonia cation radical reacts with another molecule of ammonia in the gas phase to produce an ammonium ion. The ammonium ion can either transfer a hydrogen proton to the substrate producing the protonated substrate or an adduct can be formed between ammonium ion and the substrate producing a mass which is 18 uh, units more than the substrate mod because of the adduct formation. We will see some examples of the chemical ionization mass spectrum recorded using ammonia as a reagent gas soon. Isobutane can be used as a reagent gas. Essentially isobutane gets uh, ionized in the form of isobutane cation radical. The isobutane cation radical loses a hydrogen to produce a tertiary butyl cation. Uh, this tertiary butyl cation essentially donates a hydrogen pro proton to the substrate producing the protonated substrate which is ion that is detected. Alternatively, the tertiary butyl radical, so the tertiary butyl cation itself can form an adduct with the substrate producing the tertiary butylated substrate. Essentially, this is an ion which is detected in the mass spectrometer. These are some examples of chemical ionization mass spectrum of methane as the reagent gas. The compound is lavandulyl acetate. This is a essential ingredient of the lavender flower, the fragrance responsible for the lavender flower. And the molecular weight of this compound is 196. What is registered in the mass spectrum is 197 as the molecular ion peak. This is essentially because of the protonation. The proton adds one mass unit more to the molecular weight. So the protonated species is what is registered in the uh, methane carrier gas, methane as a reagent gas in the chemical ionization mass spectrum. When isobutane is used for example, isobutane the protonated species is much more abundant than the methane as the reagent gas and the chemical ionization mass spectrum using isobutane as a reagent gas essentially gives the protonated species of the lavandulyl acetate. Now when the compound is 
used for chemical ionization mass spectrum using ammonia as the reagent gas. There are two peaks formed. This is the protonated species which is the base peak 197 mass unit 100 percent uh, relative abundance for example. This is about 18 mass units more than the molecular ion peak. Molecular ion is uh, 196. If you add 18 you will get 214. So, that essentially corresponds to the adduct with the ammonium ion. Substrate plus ammonium ion would give this particular peak at uh, 214 as the mass unit of this particular peak. So, this is what I mentioned when I said in this particular case ammonium ion can either donate a proton or it can actually form an adduct and this is what is seen. It is donating both the proton as well as forming an adduct when the ammonia is used as the reagent gas in the chemical ionization mass spectrum of lavandulyl acetate. These are some mass spectral studies of chemical ionization mass spectral studies. This particular amino acid does not give a molecular ion peak when electron impact ionization is used for example. So, when methane is used as a reagent gas and the chemical ionization mass spectrum is done, it gives very clearly the molecular ion peak. The molecular weight is 160, what you register is 161 corresponding to M plus hydrogen cation radical. In other words, this is the molecular sorry this is cannot be a cation radical this is the protonated species of this particular molecule m plus h plus is what is registered in this particular case now when isobutyl is used as the reagent gas it is not only the protonated species that is formed in addition to that the tertiary butylated substrate is also formed and this is corresponding to the molecular weight plus the tertiary butyl cation weight is also added to this 217 corresponds to the substrate plus the tertiary butyl cation adduct is what is registered in this particular case. Now, molecule like glucose for example, undergoes extensive fragmentation in electron impact ionization mass spectrometry. This is very typical of many sugar derivatives, particularly when the sugar derivative has free hydroxy functional group without any protecting groups protecting the hydroxy functional group. So, in order to get the molecular ion peak of glucose, this was done using the chemical ionization mass spectrometry using ammonia as the reagent gas. So, what you see is 18 mass units more than the molecular weight corresponds to the ammonium ion adduct of the glucose is what is registered as the molecular ion peak in this particular case. There is a very small amount of the 180 peak is also formed in this process, but the essentially the molecular ion peak plus the ammonium ion, the molecule plus the ammonium ion, the adduct is what is registered as the base peak in this particular case. This is a trifunctional molecule. There is a keto functional group, there is a nitro functional group, and there is an aldehyde functional group. Aliphatic nitro compounds typically tend to lose the NO2 group during the course of electron impact ionization mass spectrum. In fact, the molecular weight is 283. You do not see any peaks around 280-283 region indicating that the molecular ion is very short lived to be registered in the electron impact ionization mass spectrum. What is registered is molecular ion minus 30 mass unit, molecular ion minus 48 mass unit which all corresponds to the loss of for example, NO2 group or NO as the group or HNO2 as a group, these are the losses that takes place during the fragmentation process and as a result of that, the molecular ion is not detected in the mass spectrum of this particular compound. However, when this is carried out using methane as a reagent gas and a chemical ionization mass spectrum is registered, you very clearly see the molecular ion peak at 284, which is essentially the molecular weight plus one proton this is a protonated species is what is registered. So, one can use the chemical ionization mass spectrometry technique whenever the electron impact ionization fails to produce the molecular ion peak of that particular compound. Now, what are the characteristics of a molecular ion peak? Usually, the peak corresponding to the highest mass to charge ratio m by z ratio as long as it is not forming any adducts and isotope peaks are not present that is the ion that is produced with the highest mass would correspond to the molecular ion. There is something called a nitrogen loan. It is fairly simple to understand. Whenever an organic molecule contains an odd number of nitrogen, the molecular weight also will be odd because nitrogen is a trivalent element. So, as a result of that, molecular ion uh, is an odd number. <coughs> when there are even number of uh, nitrogen present, of course, the molecular weight will become even number. So, this is what is known as the nitrogen loan. Compounds containing odd number of nitrogen atoms have odd mass and even number of nitrogen atom has a even mass. 
there are two parameters which one can derive from a mass spectrum. One is a precision mass which is extremely valuable because it gives information regarding the elemental composition. The second one is the isotope peaks which also gives important information regarding the elemental composition. We will see these two aspects in a minute. First we will talk about the precision mass. When the mass of atoms are calibrated, atomic masses are calibrated using carbon-12 as a standard. In other words, you make carbon-12 as the 12.0000 as the standard for the atomic weight scale. Then carbon-13 is 13.003355. This fractional weight is extremely important. Hydrogen is 1.007825, for example, when carbon-12 is used as a standard. Likewise, every element has an isotope with a fractional atomic weight when carbon-12 is taken as a standard. This fractional atomic weight is what is responsible for the precision mass. Suppose mass spectrometer is capable of detecting the mass or capable of analyzing the masses to 4 or 5 decimal place accuracy, then it will make a difference in terms of the molecular composition of the compound depending upon the fractional weight that one observes. Let us take an example. The consequence of this is that, the, I mean the consequence of the fractional weight is that uh, two molecules with identical nominal mass, in other words the unit mass resolution mass for example, and different elemental compositions such as in the case of formic acid and dimethyl ether, they will differ significantly in the fractional weight. If you take formic acid, there is one carbon, let us say that is carbon 12 and there are two hydrogen, the two hydrogen would correspond to 2 times 1.007825 and two oxygens would correspond to 2 times 15.994915. If you add up all these numbers, what one would get is 46.0054 and if you do the same thing for dimethyl ether, the number that one gets is 46.0340. Although the molecular weights are same, which is 46 in unit resolution, if you go for high resolution mass spectrum, the fractional weights that you see here essentially differentiate these two molecules in terms of the molecular composition of the molecules. This is better illustrated in this particular table. Nitrogen, carbon monoxide and ethylene, all of them have the same unit mass. In terms of uh, unit resolution mass, it is 28 each. However, if you look at the precision mass, the fractional molecular weight that you see for each one of them is very different. So if the you know, mass spectrum is capable of, for example, detecting the mass as 22.0016148, it would essentially correspond to only a nitrogen molecule. It will not correspond to either carbon monoxide or ethylene in spite of the fact they have the same atom, uh, molecular weight of the compounds are essentially same. This is again illustrated for another fairly uh, medium sized molecule for example with a molecular weight of 84 and the fractional weights are entirely different depending upon the molecular composition of the compound. So if one mass spectrum can measure the fractional weights accurately to four decimal places that will essentially lead to the calculation of the molecular formula from the fractional weight. So the high resolution mass spectrometer is an extremely valuable tool it essentially gives you the molecular composition very nicely from the fractional uh, molecular weights that can be determined using a mass spectrometer. Before we go on, let us define what is the resolution of a mass spectrometer. How do we define? The definition is the ability of the spectrometer to resolve two peaks that differ by a mass difference of delta m. Let us say there is a mass of m1 and m2, m1 minus m2 is essentially the delta m. The precision mass of formic acid and dimethyl ether differ significantly. In other words, if we take the difference between these two, it corresponds to 0 0.0286. That is the difference between the accurate mass of the formic acid and dimethyl ether. Now the resolution is defined as m divided by delta m. m is essentially 46. The unit resolution mass is 46 and the difference between these two fractional mass is essentially 0 0.086. So as long as the mass spectrometer has a resolving power of 1600 or so, it will be able to differentiate between this mass and this mass. This is essentially what constitutes a high resolution mass spectrometer. Now 1600 is a very very small number for the resolution because mass spectrometers which are modern mass spectrometers which are available in the market now, they can typically go to 10,000, 50,000 or about 1 million resolution in terms of the mass resolution that one can obtain using this modern mass spectrometer. So even high molecular weight compounds can be fairly easily 
uh, treated for high resolution mass and the precision mass can be used for the calculation of the frag uh, elemental composition of this one. There are computer programs available nowadays where you plug in the high resolution mass and the elements that are present in the uh, compound that will essentially give you the molecular composition, the various possibilities of molecular compositions of that particular molecule that we are dealing with. The second aspect that is important aspect is the isotope peaks. Many elements have more than one natural isotope. This is extremely important. Therefore, the isotope peaks are also seen in the mass spectrum. You remember the isotope separation by J. J. Thomson of the neon isotopes 20 and 22. Essentially, you register both the isotopes 20 as well as 22 in the mass spectrum. Similarly, if you take for example, a carbon mass spectrum, you will register both carbon 12 as well as carbon 13 because carbon 13 has a finite abundance in nature. <coughs> Now, let us take the simple example of ethylene. Ethylene molecular weight is 28. This is a low resolution molecular weight is what we are talking about in this discussion. The focus is on the isotope peaks and not on the high resolution mass. So, molecular uh, weight of 28 is registered in the M by Z value of 28. In addition to that, there are peaks at 29 as well as 30, although their relative intensities are much less than the base peak of the molecular ion peak. So, the M plus 1 which is 29 corresponds to 2.23 percent and the M plus 2 which is 30 corresponds to 0 0.01 percent of the uh, base peak intensity for example. How can you register 29? If there is a carbon 13 in the molecule or a deuterium in the molecule which are naturally available isotopes of carbon 13 and proton, uh, pr uh, carbon 13 and hydrogen, when the ethylene is both C12 and all the hydrogens are H1, this is what one registers. If one of the carbon is a carbon 13, one would register a molecular, uh, molecular weight of 29 or if one of the hydrogen is a deuterium, that will also be registered at 29. Suppose both hydrogen, uh, deuterium and carbon 13 are present or two deuterium atoms are present as isotopes in a ethylene molecule, that will be very low abundance because it is a uh, extremely small amount it's in naturally natural abundance is so small that the probability of having two of these higher isotopes in a molecule is going to be much lower than the single isotope molecules which are seen here now let me introduce you to an interactive table that is available in the web this is the website address if you go to this particular website you will see the periodic table which is shown as a screenshot here for example and the number that is mentioned in each of the boxes at the bottom is the number of isotopes that is available for this particular element. So, suppose if I want to find out how many isotopes are available for a palladium, it says 9 isotopes and if I want to know what are the 9 isotopes, I just click on palladium, then all the 9 isotopes pop out of the screen in this fashion. Now, some of the isotopes have zero abundance, which means that they are not naturally available isotope. It may be a synthetic isotope also and the natural isotopes are given the abundance value. For example, 104 palladium has an abundance of 11, 105 has an abundance of 22, 106 has an abundance of 27 and so on. So, essentially you get the information about the available isotope, natural abundance of the various available isotopes in the particular atom is what is, particular element is what we are seeing in the periodic table. It is a very useful periodic table especially if you want to find out the molecular composition, isotopic abundance, distribution of isotopes and so on, you can easily find out using the uh, periodic table which is inter interactive periodic table. Now, this gives you the isotope ratios and the molecular composition. Because the molecular composition and isotope ratios are interrelated, for carbon monoxide for example, if the molecular ion peak is 100 percent, then the M plus 1 will be 1.12 and the M plus 2 will be 0.2. In the ha other hand, if you have nitrogen, it will not have an M plus 2 because nitrogen uh, 14 and 15 are the most abundant isotope, 19, 16 is not available, so you do not have a M plus 2. So, if you register the molecular weight of 28 and look at the uh, higher molecular isotopes, isotopomers for example, if it is having an M plus 1 as well as M plus 2, then it is certainly only carbon monoxide. The nitrogen although having a same molecular weight will not have the M plus 2 ion as the isotope peak. In the case of ethylene and uh, C6H6 and uh, diosomethane kind of molecule which have the 
sorry ethylene has a molecular weight of 28 as same as the carbon monoxide and nitrogen that will also have a higher isotope but the isotope m plus 1 ratio is very different in these two cases so from the ratios one can actually calculate the elemental composition of the molecule how is it done suppose if the molecular ion m plus is having a 100 percent abundance the abundance of the m plus 1 what are the contributing factors that is what is mentioned here to contribute to m plus 1 if there are n number of uh, carbons in this molecule then the number of carbon times 1.1 which is 1.1 is the carbon 13 abundance so 1.1 times the carbon 13 abundance is going to contribute to m plus 1 or it is the number of hydrogen times 0 0.016 this is a deuterium isotope abundance that will also contribute to m plus 1 so essentially you can see the contributors corresponding to m plus 1 and the contributors corresponding to m plus 2 in the case of carbon if it were to be two carbons present in the molecule as carbon 13 it will be 1.1 times the 1.1 abundance of the carbon 13 that is why this is given in this to the power 2 essentially indicating there is a very small fraction of a molecule which will have two carbon 13 simultaneously in the molecule and that would essentially contribute to m plus 2 now let us look at the isotope abundance peak of something like a c60 if you go back here c60 if you want to know what is the m plus ion m plus 1 ion uh, abundance if the molecular ion is 100 percent all you need to do is plug in this number 60 here times 1.1 that would correspond to 66 there are no other elements present in the uh, c60 so only carbon is contributing so if m plus ion is 100 percent m plus 1 ion should be around uh, 66 percent now you can also do the same calculation for 60 times 1.1 times the whole square divided by 200 that would turn out to be number 22 in other words you have a molecular ion peak which is 720 of 100 percent abundance if that is the 100 percent abundance ion then you have a 721 which is the one m plus one ion of this particular molecule and the m plus two ion of that particular molecule has a abundance of 22 in this particular case now let us come to the halogen isotope chlorine and bromine are extremely important and they are easily detected in a mass spectrum because they have two isotope with a mass difference of two units for example chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 in the intensity ratio natural abundance of about 3 is to 1 is the three times more of c35 cl35 compared to cl37 bromine has uh, isotope of 79 and 81 in equal abundance for example 50 percent of 79 and 50 percent of 81 is available on earth's crust whereas fluorine and iodine are monoisotopic fluorine exists only in fluorine 19 form and iodine exists only in iodine 127 form in the natural abundance of the two halogens which are fluorine and iodine in this particular case therefore compounds containing chlorine and bromine are easily identified in the mass spectrometry because of the prominent isotope peaks which separates which are separated by two mass units namely m and m plus 2 let us have a look at this the intensity ratios of the uh, isotope peaks can be easily calculated which is essentially coefficient of a binomial which is shown here let us say for example you have a chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 a corresponds to the abundance of chlorine 35 and b corresponds to the abundance of chlorine 35 so a plus b to the power n where n is the number of such chlorines that are present in a molecule if it is carbon tetrachloride n will be 4 if it is hexachlorobenzene n will be 6 if it is dichloromethane n will be 2 for example so the abundance of the two isotopes with the n number of halogen atoms can be easily derived from the coefficient of this particular uh, polynomial expansion that you can do suppose if two halogens are present one is bromine and another one is chlorine if there are two bromines and one chlorine present let us illustrate the example using this this is the polynomial expansion that one needs to do let us say this is bromine 79 and this is bromine 81 and this is uh, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 the expansion essentially gives you this a plus b whole to the power 2 because there are two bromines c plus d whole to the power 1 because there is one one chlorine which relates to this particular expression here now if you plug in the abundance as 1 is to 2 1 is to 3 ratio for the chlorine and 1 is to 1 for the bromines here this is what the coefficients are going to look like let us say for example if it is chlorine 
30, 35 and 37 that will be 3 is to 1 ratio. If it is bromine 79 and 81 that will be 1 is to 2 is to 1 in terms of the uh, coefficients of the binomial that we have expanded. Now, this essentially corresponds to 3 is to 6 is to 3 when you multiply by 3 and when you multiply by 1 it is 1 is to 2 is to 1 and this remember the 6 and the 1 relative intensity correspond to the m plus 2 and this corresponds to the m plus 4 and this corresponds to the m plus 6. In other words, a combination of chlorine 35 and 81 will have essentially the same mass as a combination of chlorine 37 and bromine 79, which will be the m plus 2 ions. So, one needs to be careful to add up the corresponding molecular weights of compounds in order to obtain the relative ratios of the isotopics that one would see this kind of a situation. Using such a procedure, I have calculated the isotope ratio of the various bromine and the chlorine containing molecules for example. If there is only one bromine, it will be 1 is to 1 ratio, 79 81 will be 1 is to 1. If there are two bromines in the molecule, the molecular ion peak will be 100 and the ratio of the isotope peaks will be 1 is to 2 is to 1. This is the relative intensities that we are talking about and this is the ratios of the intensity that is given separately here. So, essentially you can see this is a Pascal triangle kind of a thing as far as the bromine is concerned. When it comes to chlorine, it is a 3 is to 1 ratio if only one chlorine is there. If there are two chlorines present, it will be 9 is to 6 is to 1 and so on. So, one can easily determine the uh, ratios of the isotope peaks of the halogens using this kind of a polynomial expansion and identifying the coefficient of the polynomial. Let us look at examples of mass spectra containing bromine containing compounds and this is the spectrum of bromobenzene. Bromobenzene has one bromine, so the molecular weights are 156 and 158. If the mo molecular weight is 156, that would correspond to bromine 79 isotope. 158 would correspond to bromine 81 isotope. And this is appearing in nearly 1 is to 1 ratio as the molecular ion in the molecular ion region. The small peaks that you see here are the m plus 1 and the m plus 3 whereas this is m and m plus 2. The m plus 1 and m plus 3 are essentially coming as isotopes from the carbon and the deuterium component of this molecular formula and when the molecule loses a bromine by fragmentation, it gives only one peak corresponding to the phenyl cation. Since the phenyl cation does not have any bromine, it does not show any m plus 2 peak. However, it shows a m plus 1 peak because of the carbon 13 and deuterium content of the molecular formula. This is bromostyrene. You cannot tell which bromostyrene we are talking about in terms of the isomer of the bromostyrene. Nevertheless, one can see the molecular ion peak at 182 and 184 corresponding to bromine 79 and bromine 81. When it loses a bromine, you see a single peak of styrile cation which is 103 of molecular weight. This is com compound containing two bromines for example, 2,6-dibromoaniline. So, both the bromines can be 79, one bromine can be 79, the other bromine can be 81 or both the bromines can be 81. There are three possibilities. In the ratio of 1 is to 2 is to 1, you get the molecular ion peak, 249, 251, 253 corresponding to M, M plus 2 and M plus 4 ions of this particular molecule. Now, this is another molecule. Unfortunately, this molecule does not show the molecular ion peak because of extensive fragmentation. A very tiny little amount of the molecular ion is formed from which the information is extracted as M plus 365, 367, 369 corresponding to the presence of 2 bromine in the intensity ratio of 1 is to 2 is to 1 and the loss of 1 bromine results in the formation of the fragmented ion at 286 and 288 corresponding to 79 and 81 bromine isotopes. So, the presence of bromine is easily detected in the mass spectrum. If you look carefully at the intensities of the ions which are M and M plus 2, mass unit difference should be 2 and the intensity should correspond to the two bromines being 1 is to 1 ratio in the natural abundance 79 and 81 and this is a very very valuable tool to identify the presence of chlorine as well as bromine in uh, mass spectra using mass spectroscopic te mass spectrometric technique and this is what is illustrated in this particular example. 
So to conclude, let us conclude by saying that uh, we have looked at the basic principle behind the electron impact ionization mass spectrum and the chemical ionization mass spectrum. We also looked at the importance of the precision mass, how it relates to the molecular composition. We also relate to the importance of the isotopic peaks and how it is related to the molecular composition. One can in principle get the molecular composition if you know the isotope abundance peaks and calculate it backwards to arrive at the molecular formula. In terms of small molecules, it is easy enough to identify the molecular formula from the isotope abundance peak of m plus 1 and m plus 2. Finally, the major isotope abundance peaks of halogens, particularly chlorine and bromine for example. Some illustrative examples were shown for the brominated compound. Similarly, one can also show for the brominated compound. I thank you very much for your attention.